Well, friends, a warm welcome to the morning service. We pray that the Lord's presence will be with us together in pew and in pulpit as we wait upon him today by faith and with expectation. Uh, the evening service, <coughs> uh, 6.30 here in Port Mahomac, uh, via, and via Facebook and uh, some facility as well. And the service is next Lord's Day at the same time, 12 noon and 6.30, uh, here in Port Mahomac, and the preacher expected is the Reverend uh, John Keddy. And the retiring collection next Lord's Day uh, for the Fabric Fund. And the midweek meeting uh, will be here uh, well, sorry, it will be on Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Uh, via Zoom. And uh, the only item, as far as I know, for collection is uh, that my own home mission uh, worker newsletter, which you can uh, pick up uh, at the door uh, on the way out. All, this is, uh, uh, all these intimations, of course, are God-willing. Uh, let us uh, worship God then together by singing to his praise and glory in Psalm 19. Psalm 19 from verse 7. God's law is perfect and converts the soul in sin that lies. God's testimony is most sure and makes the simple wise. The statutes of the Lord are right and do rejoice the heart. The Lord's command is pure and doth light to the eyes impart. Down through to the end of verse Mark 11. Moreover, they thy servant warn how he his life should pray. A great reward provided is for them that keep the same. These verses, God's law is perfect and converts.
Well, friends, let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, uh, we pray for thy presence uh, to be with us in the midst of our uh, gathering together as, as an assembly. Uh, today, today here as we seek uh, to worship the one living and uh, true God. And uh, while it is easy for us to stand like this and utter words and to invite our uh, friends in the pews to stand with us, uh, we pray, Lord, uh, that thou wilt manifest uh, thyself uh, even today through the power of thine own Holy Spirit uh, in our midst as a people in pew uh, and in pulpit, uh, as a people and as preacher alike. And uh, we acknowledge, Lord, that all will be in vain without thee. If thy presence go not with us, take us not up from hence. Uh, but uh, what a different uh, place it will be today when God is in our midst. And we would uh, pray, Lord, for that experience that others had when they heard uh, sounds from heaven uh, of a mighty rushing wind, even in their midst. It was a memorable occasion. And uh, we pray that it might be a day to remember uh, for us here together today uh, around uh, thy word as uh, we seek uh, to worship thee made be in spirit and in truth. Uh, and help us, Lord, to surrender our hearts. We all have sinful hearts, and uh, we dare not say otherwise. For if we say that we have uh, no sin, we deceive ourselves. Uh, the truth is not in us, and we make God a liar. Uh, for all have sinned, and we have come short of the glory of God. There is none good, no, not one. And uh, we marvel that even for hell deserving sinners, uh, that uh, there is hope even for the hopeless. Uh, when we claim thy promise by faith, uh, that uh, if we confess our sins, thou art faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. And even for the believer eh, who is conscious of his own shortcomings, eh, they are able to claim God's promise by faith that if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous, who died not for our sins only, eh, but for the sins of the whole world. Lord, we pray thy blessing then upon us here together today, one with another, eh, from the youngest infant to the oldest adult. And uh, we may have come through the church door eh, today unconverted. We pray, Lord, that before the morning closes, eh, before we leave as we leave, that we might be saved, eh, that we might be born again. May that be true of us all, that we are saved by the grace of God, eh, that uh, we might uh, come to be genuine Christians, having the grace of God in our hearts, living by faith, and that our greatest and uh, deepest lover eh, would be the Lord God, who first loved us and who gave himself for us. Lord, we acknowledge that our love for thee is like the waves of the sea, uh, that ebb and flow. But we marvel at uh, God's uh, love for sinners, uh, that I have loved thee with an everlasting uh, love, love that is as vast as the ocean itself. Who of us can fathom that? Give us the Lord to appreciate the love of God when he gave heaven's best, uh, that he emptied uh, heaven for us, that God so loved the world that he gave. Eh, and we marvel that Christ eventually gave himself eh, to die the death of death upon the cross of Calvary, the greatest act of love that this world has ever seen. Greater love has no man than this, that a man should lay down his life eh, for his friend. We acknowledge, Lord, that we are groping in the dark to understand the length and the breadth, the height and the depth of Christ's eternal love. 
Lord, help us this day to lay hold of the truths of Scripture by faith. We pray that thou shalt remember all our loved ones near and far, those within our midst today who are praying for their sons and daughters, who are praying for their own children, for brothers, for sisters, for husbands and for wives who are yet strangers to thy sovereign grace and who are living for this world only. We pray, Lord, that what they have heard growing up, that the seed sown would be watered by thyself, eh, so that there may be a great spiritual harvest in their lives, eh, and that they too would come to be united with us in the gospel, eh, that we might be one with them and they one with us, eh, singing the same great song, The Lord is uh, my shepherd. We pray that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ would come to be more precious to us uh, as we seek to be running with patience the race that is set before us, the greatest race on earth, uh, the Christian uh, race, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And the Lord, uh, we pray that thou wilt strengthen us in the faith. Uh, thy people often struggle with unbelief. They struggle with uh, sin and uh, uh, doubt, and uh, so often are uh, tempted. Lord, we pray that thou wilt lead us uh, onwards and uh, forwards, so that there may not uh, be go uh, going back uh, with us, uh, but uh, pressing on towards the mark of our high calling, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We pray, Lord, that thou wilt... Uh, uh, Bless the congregation. We feel a, a heavy heart for them here in the light of their providence over the last while. Uh, we can hardly believe uh, that the pulpit here is vacant. Uh, and to that end, Lord, we pray that thou wilt bless them uh, and compensate them for their uh, loss. They have had a great loss as a congregation. Uh, having lost to this world their pastor uh, and the minister. And uh, we feel uh, for his uh, widowed wife, uh, as we do for the children as well, uh, those of them who are living in the local community uh, and those of them who are living f further away, uh, especially a son uh, and uh, family over in China. Lord God, we pray that thou wilt be a father unto them. And we pray that thou wilt be a husband, eh, even to Mrs. Uh, eh, MacLeod. And that thou wilt undertake for them, eh, even in their providence, doing for them exceedingly and abundantly more than what we can ask. Eh, or even uh, begin to think. And uh, Lord, uh, we pray that thou wilt continue to minister to them here. Uh, through thine own uh, precious word. And we pray that uh, the word of God would change our lives. While it is easy for us to read, to hear, and uh, uh, to listen, and to meditate, we pray that we might come to be doers of God's word, that we might live out thy word in practice in our day-to-day -day lives, that thy word would be bound upon our necks and written upon the table of our hearts so that we might find good understanding eh, before God and uh, before men, and that we would in all our ways acknowledge thee, that God would direct our path. We pray then, Lord, that thou wouldst leave us not to ourselves, eh, take self and uh, sin away, that we might be found under the shed blood, under the shadow eh, of the Almighty, we thank thee that uh, none has ever knocked at the door of mercy, uh, who has been uh, turned away. And uh, may we, Lord, uh, knock, uh, call upon thee, seek thee, and ask, claiming thy promise. Ask, and ye shall receive. Seek, and ye shall find. Uh, knock, and the door shall be opened unto thee. Lord, bless our praise, bless our uh, meditation and our reading, our worship of God. May we have an eye to thy glory. And all we ask for is in the precious name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. We'll continue our praise this time in Psalm 49. 
Psalm 49 from the beginning. Hear this, all people, and give ear, all in the world that dwell, both low and high, both rich and poor, my mouth shall wisdom tell. My heart shall knowledge meditate, I will incline my ear to parables, and on the heart my sayings doth uh, declare. Down through to the end of verse Mark 7. Yet none of these his brother can redeem by any way, nor can he unto God for him sufficient ransom pay. These verses, to the praise of God, hear this, all people, and give ear. Well, friends, we'll read God's word uh, together from the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of uh, the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity, thirty and eight years. And when Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. 
The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me hold said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed uh, wist not, knew not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus eh, which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, eh, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. That all men should honour the Son, even as they honour the Father. He that honoureth not the Son, honoureth not the Father, eh, which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I can of mine own self do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judge <coughs> <coughs> and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. He sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man. But these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his uh, light. And so on. Amen. May the Lord richly add his uh, blessing to the reading of his own uh, precious word. We'll continue our praise, this time in Psalm 40. <clears throat> Psalm 40, from the beginning. I waited for the Lord my God, and patiently did bear. At length to me he did incline my voice and cry to hear. He took me from a fearful pit, and from the miry clay, and on a rock he set my feet, establishing my way. Down through to the first part of verse 5. O Lord my God, full many are the wonders thou hast done. Thy gracious thoughts to us would far above all thoughts are gone. These verses I waited for the Lord my God and patiently eh, did bear.
Well, friends, if we can consider um, verse 24 as our text in the chapter that we read together there in Gospel of John, chapter 5. Verse 24, the words of uh, the Lord uh, Jesus himself. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting light and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed uh, from death uh, unto life. Can I maybe uh, begin uh, this morning by quoting to you uh, words once uh, uh, written by the famous French mathematician, Blaise Pascal. Uh, profound words, simple words, but very profound. He says, between us and heaven or hell, there is only one life. One life, which is the frailest thing in the world. Surely we all know that. You know, and friends, with this one life that we all have, we're all going to die at the end of the day, one death. We all know the statistic. We know it very well. One out of one people eh, die. Sin makes sure of that. That's the reason that people die. I get often asked many questions in my work, in the highways and byways, but not that seldom do I, do I get asked what I was asked by somebody last year on the streets of Inverness. Why should people, why must people die? The wages of sin is death. Spurgeon, in his own unique way, he says, sin has digged every grave that has ever been dug, he says, and fall eh, into it. We must. Fall into the grave, we must. You know, friends, that's not the end. Eh, that's not the end, despite the fictitious and foolish mindset eh, of people out there eh, in the world. The masses overlook that there is a day coming when we will actually uh, arise and come out of these very graves where we've been placed in a coffin, in a wooden box or in whatever, uh, six feet under. Hear it at funeral, death, decay, his passing, her passing, your demise, your burial. That's not the end. This, my friend, has to be impressed uh, upon our minds. Listen to what the writer in Hebrew says. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after uh, this, the judgment. Now, there's further evidence of this reality in uh, the verse that we've uh, read uh, here in this uh, chapter. Verse 25. Notice, verily, verily, Jesus says, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live, in which all that are in their graves. Notice, all which are in their graves. What kind of grave? Yes, the grave in the cemetery, but it's also the grave in whatever soil that grave is. It's the grave of the sea, it's the grave of embalmment, it's the grave of creation, it's the grave of a fish's belly. Bodies will, will decompose in any of uh, these graves at the end of the day. They'll decompose. But on the great last day, all these bodies shall hear, his for shall hear God's voice and come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. You know, friends, that's a fearful uh, thought, if the latter end uh, is true of us. You know, I hope that whatever else we believe, that we believe the truths uh, of Scripture, that we believe that there's a great last day of judgment, that there's a great last day looming around uh, uh, the corner when we must stand before God. Uh, and with our arms stretched, our hands empty, and 
our appearance personal. So every one of us shall give account of himself to God. You know, you would think, humanly speaking, in the light of this reality that everybody would be preparing for death, in the light of a certain death, a certain judgment, a certain eternity that's lying before men, women, boys and girls, you would think that any and every rational person would be preparing for whatever, what is for, for what's beyond the grave. When God himself clearly says, prepare eh, to meet thy God. Prepare, he says, to meet thy God. But people aren't preparing. They, they, they force these truths out of their mind as though it were but the figment of man's imagination. That it's not really, it's something that's been made up. As somebody said to me at, at the end of the year, that old book. You people, that's what he called the, 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 the believers, you creme de la creme, Christians believe everything that this book says. He says it's fictitious. Well, you know what, friends? God never lies. God never lies. God isn't a fictitious God that we have. He's not a fictitious God. Many are of the persuasion that they only have a body and that it'll rot away at the end of the day. Like somebody said recently, I'll only become compost, fertilizer and food for the plants and the flowers. It's the biggest hell, the biggest lie that came ever, uh, that ever came out of hell. The devil himself is the father of lies. This is what the, the, the devil will have you a uh, believe, that he'll have you believe that there's no God, that there's no afterlife, that there's no body and soul that will be reunited together on the great last day of judgment. It's what's been made up by silly religious fanatical men and women all over the world since the beginning of time. Well, my friends, God doesn't play tricks with anyone. He doesn't play tricks with people's minds, as Boris Johnston and, Mad and, and, and our first minister in Edinburgh. They play pre pre tricks on, with people's minds. They've been doing that even over the last year with these laws and rules and regulations that have left people utterly confused. God doesn't confuse anyone. He's not the author of confusion. You know, I'm often told that a madman for giving up everything in life, for simply telling people how to get to heaven and to be saved from their, their sins. You're a madman. And yet people will glibly say, as, like one lady said as well, it doesn't bother me, she says, if I go down to hell tonight. Or like the lady who said, when my time is up, I think I'm going down. Who is the madman at the end of the day? Who is really the madman? The story is told of George Whitfield. He, he, recalls, he recounts this himself, uh, the great uh, evangelist. And he says he once saw uh, some criminals riding in a cart on their way to the gallows. And he says they were arguing like a bunch of, of kids uh, about who should sit on the right hand side of, of the cart. These men were condemned to die, and the only thing that was worried about them, what, that, that they were concerned about, was who would get the best seat on their way to the, to the execution. They were going into eternity and had no more concern than children sitting in daddy's car, wondering who'll get the best seat in the front. That's how warped, friends, how, the, how warped the heart of man is regarding the things that matter most at the end of the day. They forget us, our friend Thomas Chalmers reminds us that the sum and substance, he says, of the preparation needed for a coming eternity is that you believe what the Bible tells you and that you do what the Bible bids you. 
Well, I want to consider with you for a few moments this morning what the Bible wants us to believe and what Scripture bids us to do in words that we have here that fell from the lips of our Lord Jesus uh, himself in verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. Three simple headings. Hearing unto life, believing unto life, and then passing uh, unto life. Firstly, hearing unto life. The background that we have here was Jesus was preaching. He was actually preaching in Jerusalem, we find here, to Jews. Hardened Jews who were skeptical, who were suspicious of this man, Jesus, his ministry and uh, uh, his miracles. You know, these Jews saw not just extraordinary things happening before their very eyes, but supernatural things, miraculous uh, things. They saw Jesus performing things that they had never seen uh, happening before, something that no mere man uh, could actually perform, and yet they weren't convinced by who he was or what he was about. You read here when you go home of a man, read it for yourselves, of a man who was 38 years uh, ill. He was a sick man. He was in many ways a, a, a cripple. He suffered hurt, he suffered pain for these 38 long spring, summers, autumn and winters until this very memorable day when Jesus comes along and he heals uh, and cures him. Now this man probably went to many physicians and doctors in his own day looking for a cure. Is that not what happens when we fall ill? When we become unwell, we go to the physicians of this world. We plead for their help. If there's anything that they can do for us, what they can prescribe for us, the best. We want the best medicine so that we're back on our feet again. It's not extraordinary here. 38 long years of, of a severe uh, illness. Jesus performs a miracle and we see him uh, up on his feet again and walking and carrying that very mattress that he had slept on for 38 years. Verse 9, and immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. despite what they had been an eyewitness to. You know, you'd have thought that they would have paused, these Jews, c considered what they, what they had seen, what they, was happening before their very eyes. You know what they did? They harangued the Lord. They had asked him, they harangued him, and they hounded him, hounded him. They, cru they, they, they criticized what he did to the extent that it eventually read, uh, 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 led to his uh, uh, persecution. Why? Because of two things. Because firstly, he did this miracle uh, on the Sabbath day. It was a no-no. You did everything on six days, but you didn't do anything on the seventh day. It was the Sabbath day. And because of who he claimed he was, he claimed not the Jews, you see, made often reference to God as our father. But Jesus says here, my father. They were appalled. He's equaling himself. He's putting himself on equal par with God the father. They wouldn't have any of it. There was only one God. How could Jesus be on equal par with, the, with, with God? They ridiculed him. And they scoffed at him. You know, before we go further here, friends, notice here something that's very 
if we can say, solemn and frightening. Something very solemn here and frightening. These Jews were not just religious. They were deeply religious. They were very pious uh, in their own way. Very pious. They attended religious festivals. They strictly observed various laws and rituals. They were the lawyers of their own day. They were experts in the, in the Torah, in the law uh, of Moses. And you know what? Or something else here. They also believed that the Messiah. They, would, they also believed that the Messiah would one day come and set them free. They craved for freedom, the spiritual freedom that they didn't have. You know, yet for all their religiousness, for all their religiosity, for all their piousness, for all their, for all that they claimed to be, they didn't believe in him. They didn't believe in Jesus Christ, in his person, and they didn't believe in his word. They were only gimmicks at the end of the day, if we can say they were pretenders. Pretenders and gimmicks. You know, friends, it's a fearful thing to do exactly what these Jewish people did. They closed their ears to what they heard. They closed their eyes to what they saw happening in front of them. And their hearts, they didn't allow these truths that they heard from the Lord to sink uh, down into their hearts. Oh, they listened, but they didn't hear and believe. That's the crux of the matter. They listened, but they didn't hear and believe. I hope that none of us friends here in Pope today are like that. I hope that none of us fall into that category, the category that these Jews fell into here. You know how long suffering and mercy for the Lord is. You know, he doesn't give up on these people. He could quickly have turned his back and left them to themselves. But that's not what the Lord does here. He addresses them again and again. Notice how he addresses them with these opening words. Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you. Jesus, in the, in, in the Gospel of John, he uses these words, verily, verily, truly, truly, some 20 times. Now, surely when Jesus emphasizes or puts an emphasis on these words, verily, verily, it's as though he's saying, listen, this is serious. Give me, give me your attention. Don't be sleepy to what you're hearing. Wake up. There's a, a seriousness, and he wants a, a, their attention. Don't be deaf. What I'm about to say is serious uh, and important. You know, friends, there's nothing more serious in this world as both listening and hearing to what God has to say to, to us about the world to come. What he has to say to us about the gospel, how to be at peace with God, how to have mercy, what to do to prepare for eternity, and how to be, uh, how, uh, to be saved at the end of the day. Nothing else is as important uh, as this. You know, friends, how we respond to what we hear is going to determine our eternal destiny uh, at the end of the day, how we respond. You know, there are a thousand and one things I grant to you here today that are important to us uh, all. We don't deride or belittle any of these things. These things that are so important to us that we have to attend to, all these things are legitimate in and of themselves. But after our amen, if I can put it like that, after our amen has been said to all these things, after we've dealt with them, 
These things, whatever they are, they become so immaterial, so irrelevant, so insignificant, so unimportant in contrast to what we have here, listening to God and what he has to say to us all uh, personally. Now, it's interesting, Jesus wasn't here speaking to his friends, his Christian friends. He wasn't speaking to the disciples either. He was speaking here to these unconverted uh, Jews before him. Now, our Lord is very personal. Our Lord was always personal when he was speaking to the unconverted. He's very personal here. Notice, I say unto you. You can't get anything more personal than that. He was saying to all these Jews, I say unto you. What was he saying unto them? He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Hearing unto life. Secondly, believing eh, unto life. It's good for us all to be under God's word, isn't it? Faith cometh through hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We find Jesus here stressing the importance of you hearing his word and you doing something about it. How do we believe unto life? Maybe I should pose that question. How do we believe unto life? You know, friends, there are so many people coming to church. You know what? They don't hear anything. They'll say, what we heard, we enjoyed it. The minister, he presented the word faithfully. There was nothing wrong with what we hear. And often these very people are moved in their own hearts by what they've heard regarding the things of God, the word of God that's been preached on or uh, presented or uh, proclaimed. And yet it doesn't make any, it doesn't have uh, any impact, saving impact upon them at the end of the day. These Jews were in, in Christ's company. They were as near to him as I'm as near to you here today in the, in the pulpit here in, in Port. They heard the truth from him. He presented it in ABC, in, in a simple way. ABC. They listened to what he said, but you know, it didn't, they didn't hear anything at the end of the day. They dismissed it and regarded this man only as a religious, a crazy uh, religious uh, fanatic. You know, friends, hearing sermons and discourses, hearing preachers, hearing a minister present lectures, various um, various presentations regarding the truths of God's words, hearing readings and homilies. You know, that won't bring everlasting life or eternal salvation to any of us at the end of the day. Now, what am I saying here? What I'm saying, friend, is this, that the one and only way that we can truly hear the word of God is when we do what it says. When we do what it says. Listen to what we, we read in, in the book of James. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Our friend Thomas Watson uh, pointedly says, he says, doers of the word are the best hearers. Doers of the word, he says, are the best hearers. Remember how, how um, Lydia, we find her in Acts, 
16. She's a glowing testimony to what actually Thomas Watson uh, says uh, here. Remember, she was at a prayer meeting by the riverside outside the city uh, of Philippi. Let's notice here for one moment what happened to her when, when the Apostle Paul uh, brought the word of God uh, to her and to them who were there. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, putting an emphasis on that, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto these things which were spoken of God. Yes, God opened her heart. We know that. God opened her heart. But she wasn't a passive listener to the word that she was hearing. The word here attended, it's interesting, the word here attended means that she paid attention before doing something. She paid attention before she did something. Yes, she did something. What did she do? She believed. He that heareth my word and believeth. Isn't that wonderful? He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Lydia didn't just have a listening ear. She had a hearing heart. A hearing heart. She heard and she believed. We often make reference, and we rightly so, to the Philippian jailer. The same thing happened to, to him uh, that memorable evening when an earthquake uh, uh, shook that uh, prison cell. Oh, how he came to himself. In an instant. You see, he had been quickened by what he had heard earlier in the, in, in the inner prison cell when he heard these two men singing and praising God and, and prayer. He was convicted by what he had heard. What must he say I do to be saved? You know, friends, that's the greatest question at the end of the day that we can ask in this world. You know, and if you ask it, in all sincerity from the heart, you'll hear what he heard. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now, that's where often we end it. We forget what happened after that. Something else actually happened after that. We read in verse 32, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all, that were in his house. And they spoke to him the word of the Lord and all that were in his house. What happened? They rejoiced believing in God with all his house. Household salvation. Imagine. Household grace. Household mercy. Household forgiveness. Household cleanse, household pardon. That would, that's exactly what would happen to every household in Port Mahomet and in the outlying district today if everybody did exactly what they did here. They would be singing as they've never sung before. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear! The hour I first believed. Believing unto life. You know, somebody else wrote the following words after he heard a certain voice and believed unto life. Listen, I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, O weary one, lay down your head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, weary and worn and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he hath made me glad. Salvation had made him glad. I was listening to Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones on the way here today, and he was preaching, where is wisdom to be found? Where is wisdom to be found? The world is looking for something that will fill the inner recesses of their heart. The world thinks eating, 
drinking, working, leisure, pleasure, indulging in sex, that's going to fulfill the emptiness of man's heart. You know what? It's not. At the end of the day, you ask the Christian, the genuine Christian who's been out there in the world and who's given himself like Solomon to all that this world has to offer. Augustine's testimony is an unchanging testimony. Thou hast made us for thyself, O God, and our soul is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Hearing unto life, believing unto life. A few thoughts, finally, friends, on passing unto life. Passing unto life. Now, the passing over that we, that's described here describes the place we were all in eh, because of our sinful fallen nature. The place that every sinner is in. The place where every unconverted Christian was in once before the grace of God won his heart. Question 19 of the Catechism eh, eh, describes our fallen state when it asks, what is the misery of that estate wherein to man fell? All mankind by the fall lost communion with God are under his wrath and curse, so made liable to all the miseries of this life, to death itself and to the pains of hell forever. I hope that I'm trying to bring the word of God simply before you today. I don't want you to believe in the church today with your scratching your heads wondering, what did that preacher say today? Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden. And through the fall, and we have fallen with Adam and Eve. Eat the day that thou shalt eat of this tree, that thou, thou shalt surely die. And man has been dying eh, ever since. They came under God's judgment and God's eh, condemnation. God's judgment and God's condemnation. You know what, friends? When a believer, when a sinner comes to realize his fallen state, that he's a sinner by nature and by practice, and he cries out to God for mercy. There's a passing over. There's, as if it were, a crossing over here. We see from death unto life. Remember in, the, in Pilgrim's Progress, the Christian, he, he, his heart was open. He was convicted of his sins. He realized this city that I'm living in it's going to perish one day. I'm going to fall into judgment. He leaves the city. His eyes eh, upon another city, the city that has foundations, whose maker and whose builder is God. And he leaves the city as all and everybody were crying out to him, come back, come back. No, he says, I must leave. I must look to the light, the light of the world, to the celestial city. And he begins his pilgrimage. Eh, to the land uh, of promise. Why? Because he's a new creature. He's got a new heart. He's got new aspirations. He's got new hopes. He's got new, a new chapter has been written in the book of his life. New beginnings. A new creature. In Christ Jesus. You know, friends, I feel it would be remiss of me today in Port if I didn't ask you with all reverence, one or two questions. Where do you stand yourselves in the light of all that we've been uh, considering uh, here? Where will you spend eternity? How is it with your soul here today? Have you heard the voice of the Lord and believed? Have you done, have you passed over from death unto life. You know, I don't know what your answer is to any of these things, but what I do know here is that Jesus elsewhere in the Gospels, he's plain and blunt in the way he asks us to respond and how we hear the Gospel. Notice, notice what he says, take heed, he says, what ye hear. Take heed how ye hear. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. You know, there's a blessing in hearing by faith the word of God and believing it. How do I know that? Listen to the 
to what the prophet Isaiah tells us. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. You know the eternal consequences of not inclining our ear, not hearing, not believing, not crossing over, passing over from death uh, into life. These things doesn't, at the end of the day, bear thinking about. But you know, friends, think about them we must because we're going to be confronted with the reality of them at the end of the day. You know, the stark consequences stare us in the, in, the, in the face today through what we have read. Marvel not at this, he says, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I don't know if that terrifies you. But it certainly terrifies me. It terrifies me, my friend, and it terrifies every true minister of the gospel who seeks with all the love that they can muster to bring the glorious gospel of salvation to our people week after week and after week in pulpits throughout the length and breadth of the, of the land. Seeking that people would come to embrace that which not even death can take from them. You know, death can take everything away and in, inevitably it will. But death, think of this, death won't take a gift away, the gift that God has given. We quoted there a couple of times that the, the wages of sin is death. We thank God that it doesn't end there. It continues, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. No, oh, my friends, not even death, not even eternity, not even hell eh, can take this away. Notice what Jesus says, marvel not at this. Marvel not at this. What is, it? What, what is Jesus saying here? You see, marvel not, people were jesting. People were scoffing what they were uh, hearing. And Jesus here rebukes and warns them not to scoff or marvel at what they were hearing. You see, these Jewish leaders didn't take him seriously. Jesus was serious here in everything he said. Although they laughed, they ridiculed, they scoffed, they, they, they joked. He says, this is all serious. And I'm bringing this serious message to your attention so that you may both hear it and believe in it at the end of the day. I hope, my friends, that there's nobody here today with the spirit of the man who said once to me. What a chilling response when we spoke to him about the gospel. He says, I would rather be with my own company in hell than to be with church people in heaven. Imagine that. I would rather be with my own people in hell than to be with church people in heaven. How hard the heart of man is. You know, but if he and those like him were to come to realize that hell is a place of unutterable misery, it's a place of indescribable punishment, indescribable torment, and endless punishment. To believers in his congregation, uh, once Brownlow North, the famous uh, evangelist and uh, preacher, he was preaching in Aberdeen. He was coming to the end of his sermon. And he was preaching as Afton tried to do here today. And this is what he said 
to his congregation. He says, you'll be a believer someday. If you never believe on earth, you will, he says, believe in hell. You know, friends, there's no other hope outside hearing and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death eh, unto life. May that life be yours and mine. It'll never be taken away from us because it's a gift from God. May the Lord bless his word to us and may it register with us and may it be bound upon our necks and written upon the table of our hearts so that that very word may bring forth fruit in our lives and that it would lead us ultimately at the end of the day to embrace him as he's freely offered to us in the gospel. Let us pray. We pray, Lord, that uh, eh, when our voice has fallen silent, eh, as the voice of every preacher eh, sooner or later does, we pray that the voice of the Holy Spirit would continue to speak uh, eh, on more uh, powerfully in our hearts together, and uh, that we might not uh, forget these uh, truths. And uh, we thank thee for the power of truth, that it can never be edited. We can never add to it or subtract from it. But we marvel at what is written. Eh, the truth shall set you free. We pray that we might all be set free by the truth of God. Bless us then together as we sing our final praise in conclusion. May the glory be thine and the blessing yours. All for Jesus' sake. Amen. We'll conclude by singing to the praise of God in Psalm 116. Psalm 116. <clears throat> I love the Lord because my voice and prayers he did hear. I, while I live, will call on him who bowed to me his ear. Down through to the end of verse Mark 6. I love the Lord because my voice.
will conclude in prayer. Part us with thy uh, blessing. We pray that thou wilt come out uh, uh, with us in the evening hour, and uh, we pray that thou wilt watch over us during the course of this uh, week. In our various uh, callings, in our homes, offices, on land or on sea, we pray that thou wilt be the guardian of our most valuable possession, our precious never-dying soul. We pray, Lord, that we might have an eye to thy glory, and that thou wilt uh, come and visit our poor nation at such a time as this, even from John Agroach through to Lansend, from Cape Wrath down through to the White Cliffs of Dover. So we pray, Lord, that uh, our nation would hear what others heard, sounds from heaven uh, of a mighty rushing wind. We pray, open the floodgates of heaven, pour out a blessing, so that there may not even be enough room to contain it. Forgive us our sins even in holy things, for Jesus' sake, amen. <laughs>